Let me just pray for us as we get started reading the, the word of the Lord here. So, Father God, I thank you for this opportunity again, Lord, to, to gather. Uh, Lord, this morning we want to worship you. We want to glorify you. You're the only one worthy of our worship. We've gathered to do so. And so, Lord, I pray that you would be glorified even in this time as your word is read, is, is preached. Lord, impress upon our hearts those things that you would have us to glean from it. I pray these things in your name. Amen. So as I was preparing to speak today on missions, I am um, in youth takeover. It dawned on me that um, in a world where st- statistically 80% of church attending students stop going to church when they go to college, that we actually have a lot of students who are going out and doing some kind of mission work. And so um, I just wanted to share a little bit about that with you as we talk about missions today and, and recognize the graduates and the work that God's doing in their lives. So um, last spring, 2018, we had a, we took a mission trip to Chile. We had six high school students and one college age student go with us. Um, last summer, we had a couple high school students who did mission trips on their own. Um, Elena Dyer, she went to the Philippines, and Katie Todd, she went to the Mexico. Um, over this next summer coming up, we have four of our recent graduates who are going on short-term mission trips. Anna Freeberg, she's going to Nepal for two weeks, share the gospel in the remote villages there. Courtney McDowell is going um, to Florida, take part in the discipleship program, and uh, with an emphasis on evangelism in the local area. Trevor Mendenhall, he's going to Japan. And uh, Jenna Strom, she's going to be serving at Mount Gilead all summer, sharing the gospel with the students who come to the camp there. And uh, Rebecca Thomas, she's going to the Philippines this summer. Um, so you can clap for that. That's pretty cool stuff. The guy is doing. Yeah, it's, it's, to me, it's just really neat stuff what God is doing in our hearts as young people, impressing upon them a sense of mission. And uh, I just want to share with you this morning about missions and understanding God's heart for those people who are far from him. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at a familiar passage, um, but we're going to look at it through the lens of missions. And so you can turn to John 4. We're going to be reading in John 4 the encounter um, that Jesus has with this woman at the well. So John 4, and as we read this, it's my hope that when you leave here that you will be a um, more of a mission-minded person than when you came in today. That the effects um, of reading this and, and hearing from this, you'll be better equipped to share the gospel in the places that God puts you and that you'll be better equipped to share the gospel with the people that God has put into your lives. Um, And so before we get into John 4, I just want to answer two really important questions that will give us the framework as we think about being mission-minded people. And so the first question is, what is missions? And the second question is, why is missions important? Um, These two questions, they could be messages on their own. And so I'm going to need about two and a half hours this morning to get through this. I'm just kidding. Um, I want to do a short time on this, but hopefully do justice to it. So what is missions? Um, in seminary, I took a class called Introducing World Missions. And so right out of the book here, it says missions is the specific work of God's people and the task of reaching people for Christ by crossing cultural boundaries. And so missions is the work of God's people for Christ, reaching other people by crossing cultural boundaries. Um, This is sharing the gospel with people from a different culture. Historically, the typical idea of missions was that we would go to unreached people people groups and missionaries missionaries would go to places places where there was not access to the gospel gospel, um, or there was limited access to the gospel and people people hadn't heard about about Jesus and his power to save. And And more more recently... recently, There's There's been been the shift shift in in missions missions as as more places places have become post-Christian. Missionaries missionaries are being sent to people groups who've heard about Jesus but have rejected the gospel. And so we have in Santa Rosa a missionary 
who was sent from Reno to Santa Rosa. There's plenty of churches in Santa Rosa, right? But he was sent from Reno to uh, Santa Rosa to be a missionary there. Um, a little bit also about missions is that the crossing cultural boundaries, that's what distinguishes missions from evangelism. So that's a little bit about what is missions, and then a little on why is missions important. Why is missions important? I just want to share three reasons with you. The first is that lost people matter to God. Lost people matter to God. God cares about the lost. He cares about those who don't know him. He desires to have a relationship with them. He desires for them to have life through his son. Um, Luke 15 is, uh, the entire chapter is Jesus telling three stories of things that are lost. Does anyone know what the three things that are lost are in Luke 15? Dean, you know? What's, What's lost? lost? Lost sheep. Lost, lost coin. coin. And the prodigal son. son. Yeah, yeah, so three, three stories, stories of three, three things that are lost. Lost sheep, lost, lost coin, lost uh, son. son. And it's all making one main point. The lost people matter to God. Uh, verse 7 of Luke 15, it says, Just so... I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And so all three parables, they illustrate the point that God rejoices when lost people come to know him. And because God rejoices in that, then we as believers should rejoice in that. Why is missions important? Lost people matter to God. Second reason why missions is important is that God commands it in the scripture, that God commands it. Uh, Matthew 28, 19 through 20, it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And so this, this verse here is commonly known as the Great Commission. And what I've noticed in my own life and um, sometimes in the lives of other Christians is that oftentimes I'd rather live in great comfort than to live out the Great Commission. Um, it, this is why it's so fascinating to me that we have so many young people who want to go do missions trips because taking time to talk to other people about Jesus can be a really uncomfortable thing. It can draw us out of our comfort zones to share our faith, to possibly face rejection, disagreement. And so it's really neat um, seeing so many young people want to go share their faith with other people in the world who need to know about Jesus. Um, I want to show you a video that sort of, sort of illustrates the kind of wrong thinking that we can have with regards to the Great Commission and with comfort. So take a minute to watch this. Mom, where's Timmy? He's gone to be with the Lord. He's dead? No, silly. He and his family have moved to Bubble Creek Canyon. Do you dream of a day when you can drive to work without being forced to look at unchristian billboards and bumper stickers? When you can turn on the radio without hearing the electric guitar or some other horrible instrument of the devil? When you don't have to interact with bozos who have the audacity to disagree with you? Well, at Bubble Creek Canyon, your dreams can come true. Hello, or as we like to say at Bubble Creek Canyon, have a Bubble Creek Canyon is an isolated community nestled in 3,500 acres of magnificent and desirable real estate. Best of all, it's 100% heat and free. That's right, and you'll think it's the next best thing to heaven. At Bubble Creek Canyon, we use an elaborate screening process to ensure that our residents completely agree with our doctrine. No ifs, ands, or Buddhists. We're a heavily gated community with fantastic facilities, breathtaking sight lines, and Christianized amenities. We have a Christian shoe store, a Christian t-shirt store, a Christian underwear store, a Christian bank, Christian grocery, Christian car dealership, Christian pet store, Christian liquor store, and a Christian tattoo parlor. Temporary, of course. We have a nationally recognized school district and only one textbook. We also think you're gonna like our library. Let this filth get in here. At the 
BCC Cinema, you can watch all the latest movies without worrying about the questionable content because we removed it all. Every home comes with a spacious backyard with plenty of room for an optional baptism pool. Hey, pin the ear on the high priest soldier, one of my personal favorites. And each home comes equipped with built-in Christian signage. Just try to pull this off the wall. With our combination cable and internet package, you'll have access to ES Pray In, My Heavenly Space, God Tunes, Godopedia, God Gold, God Bay, God Cast, and The Sopranos. Every morning, a copy of our community paper will be delivered to your doorstep. And our publication is committed to protecting you from all that unpalatable bad news that's always happening around the world. Our landscaping company, Holy Ground, will make sure that your front yard is always impeccably manicured. We've added a new feature this year. Around the holidays, special sensors in the streetlights detect non-nativity ornamentation and act quickly to eliminate these unsightly eyesores. Bubble Creek Canyon, if God wasn't omnipresent, he'd probably live here. Bubble Creek Canyon. Um, if you guys aren't signed up for Right Now Media, we have a program through the church called Right Now Media. It's on, online on our website. You can sign up, uh, create your own account. It's like Christian Netflix is basically what it is. So they have a lot of videos like this and, and series going through um, uh, all kinds of different things. If you want to go through sections of the Bible or books or specific topics. So that's where that came from. Bubble Creek Canyon. Someday soon, Jesus is going to come back. Um, or we're going to go to be with Jesus. He's going to take us. And um, we'll be with him in heaven. And it won't be anything like Bubble Creek Canyon there. It's going to be a place where there's no sin. And uh, everything will be just as it should be. But until that time, God has not called us to live in these Christian bubbles. Um, in a great comfort, he's called us to live among other sinful people and to help them understand who he is and who we created them to be, to live out the Great Commission. And don't get me wrong, I think it's, uh, it's good for young people to have an appropriate need for some amount of Christian bubble with the goal of easing them into a fallen world in which they can let their light shine before others so that the world may see their good works and glorify their Father who's in heaven. So why is missions important? God commands it. God commands it. He wants us to go out into the world he wants us to share our faith. He wants us to make disciples of all the nations. Third reason there is uh, why missions is important is it's how God did it. If you think about this, it's really neat that when missionaries are sent into other cultures, it's the same strategy that God employed when he sent Jesus to earth. Um, we as people, God is holy. We are sinful our sin has separated us from God. It's broken that relationship. And so what God did, and there was nothing that we could do to restore that relationship on our own. No amount of money we could pay, no amount of good works we could do, no amount of religious activity we could do to do that. So what God did is he stepped into his story, our history, and Jesus, he sent his son to die in our place on the cross. And Jesus lived a sinless life. He went to the cross for us. He died so that if we believe in him, we might be saved. That's, a, that's the same idea here as we're sending missionaries, right? Same strategy that God employs. He sent Jesus to earth that he lived, he died, that if we would believe in him, we would be saved. So how can we be mission-minded? How can we be mission-minded? John 4, I'm finally going to read from John 4. It says, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John. Although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth day. Hour. So a little context of the story is that Jesus had left Judea. He traveled north about 40 miles and was in Samaria. It doesn't seem very far, but there's a lot of differences between the culture that he left and the culture 40 miles north of him. 
Just think about if you were in Windsor and you traveled 40 miles north to Ukiah. Big difference in culture. Um, so we also pick up here that it's about noon. And we'll go on to verse 7. It says, A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And so Jesus, he comes along alone to a well. He's tired. He's thirsty. A Samaritan woman comes alone to the well. This is not a normal time that people would gather at the well, would typically come there. They typically come there in groups, the women would, in the morning or in the evening when it was cool. For a woman to come alone in the heat of the day probably indicates that her public shame resulted in her isolation, so that she would have to come during the heat of the day, not with the other women. So Jesus, he begins a conversation with this woman. And we see from her response that she's somewhat startled that this man, Jesus, is speaking to her. Her first words to Jesus is, how is it that you, how, how is it that you, a Jew, ask me for a drink? She says, you being a Jew and me being a woman from Samaria. And you might think, well, what's, what's the big deal with that? And then there's this key piece of information for us that Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Um, the first point I want to make here with how we can be mission-minded is to be mission-minded, we must put aside our differences. To be mission-minded, we must put aside our differences. There were some big differences between Jesus, a Jewish man, and the Samaritan woman. The disciples themselves, they make it very clear how big these differences are. It says in verse 27, that when the disciples came back, that they marveled that he was talking with the woman. But no one said, what do you seek, or why are you talking to her? They, they marveled, they were amazed that he was talking to this woman, a Samaritan woman, at that. And again, you might ask, well, what's the big deal? Well, two reasons. First, she's a Samaritan. And Samaritans were a racially mixed group of partly Jewish and partly Gentile ancestry. Um, and there was a very long history between these two groups, about 700 years of ethnic and cultural tension. Um, it got so intense that at times Roman soldiers would have to be called in and people would be crucified. And so the Jews, they were not accepting of the Samaritans. The best way to put it would be that the Jews looked down, Jewish people looked down on the Samaritans. Another reason that the disciples marveled is because um, it was a social taboo for a Jewish teacher to be speaking to a woman in public. And so the oral law, the rabbi said, let no one talk with a woman in the street, no, not with his own wife. So these were cultural, not God-given rules that oppressed woman, women. And this is historically true for many people groups, even today that there's cultural rules, not God-given rules, that oppress women or, um, or other people. Um, however, that's not how Jesus sees her, right? From the disciples' standpoint, that's like two strikes for Jesus. He's talking to a Samaritan, he's talking to a woman. But from Jesus' standpoint, he blows right past those differences, and he recognizes that this woman is someone in need, despite what others may say or may think. And Jesus, he did this often. He would spend time with people that the religious leaders found socially unacceptable in an effort to find, help them find a connection with God. And I just want to pause for a little moment and, and say that um, while leaders in the church have messed up at times, Jesus, through his teaching, through his people, through his churches, through his parachurches, has done more for social equality historically and globally than any other group or person in history. Um, Jesus teaches, the Bible teaches, God teaches that we're all made in the image of God, that there's one human race, that we're equal in value, no matter what we look like or what we have done. And so the first point of being a mission-minded person is that we must put aside our differences, those cultural biases, differences that we may have. We have to put them aside. As Christians, we need to follow God's laws not cultural practices. 
So we move to John 4, verse 10, and it says Jesus, he responds, he answers her, and he says, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, then you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, and did his sons, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks from this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up into eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have not come here not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. The second point on being a mission-minded person is that we need to remember that the greatest need that people have is a spiritual need, not a physical need. The greatest need people have is a spiritual need, not a physical need. Jesus, what does he do here? He uses a play on words. He uses the physical need to point to the spiritual need. She thinks he's talking about physical water, but he's offering soul-level nourishment. And so if we are going to truly help those who are far from God, we need to help them understand that their deepest need is not a physical need, but a spiritual one. Missions-minded people aren't interested in helping people become more comfortable on their way to hell. Missions isn't about offering the American dream to a third-world country. Jesus is the difference between missions and humanitarian efforts. Take Jesus' word for it. We've been studying Mark, Mark 8, 36. Anyone know what Jesus says there? Mark 8, 36? He says, For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? That there's no profit to gain the whole world and lose your soul. Even if you had it all, everything the world had to offer, it would not be profitable without God. The Bible gives us an example of one such man. King Solomon, he was a man who was very wealthy. He was a man who was very powerful. He was a man who was very wise. He was a man who was very loved. He had over 700 wives and 300 concubines. From a worldly perspective, he had it all, and yet the conclusion he came to about life without God is that it is vanity, it is worthless, it is meaningless. Solomon's words are similar to Jesus' words. He says, what does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? In other words, apart from God, we gain nothing. Why? Because our greatest need is a spiritual need, not a physical need. Um, this doesn't mean that mission-minded people ignore physical needs. In fact, meeting physical needs often opens the door for us to share the gospel um, to meet the spiritual need. So the point here, though, is that mission-minded people, they're more interested in making a lasting, eternal impact than a temporary need. Verse 16 continues. It says, Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. And the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, 
I who speak to you am he. The third point of being a mission-minded person from John 4, as we look at how Jesus interacts with this woman, is that to be missions-minded, we must seek to understand the story. We must seek to understand the story of the people that we're going to, of the people groups, and of the individual. Jesus, he had this one in the bag, right? He's God, so he, he knows what's going on. He knew her story. He knew her background. He knew her struggles. He knew the history of the Samaritans. He knew where they worshipped. He knew how they worshipped. What I want to point out here is the woman's reaction to Jesus, that she becomes more receptive to what Jesus has to say once she realizes that Jesus knows her story. And in the same way, we will have a much greater influence on people when we know their stories. And so effective missionaries, they must know the story of the people group that they're going out to, that they're being sent to. They've got to learn the history. They've got to learn the culture. They've got to learn the language. They've got to learn the values. They need to learn the taboos. This process for missionaries, it can take years. I wanted to read you one more quote from uh, this World Missions textbook here. It says, at times the Western dominance in finance and technology can reduce missions efforts to a McDonald's approach that North American Christians may extra value meal their methodologies as packaged approaches that look the same everywhere in the world. That is the wrong type of approach for missions-minded people. There's not a packaged method that will work for all cultures and people groups. Um, The gospel is always the same, but the presentation of the gospel changes. It adapts how we share that gospel as we know and understand the culture and the background and the people. And so Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 22, I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. And so when we understand the story of people and the people groups, we can more effectively communicate the gospel in a way that they will understand. Hudson Taylor, he was a missionary to China in the 1800s. And uh, he was one of the first guys who really got this idea, and he um, started to dress like the men there, the Chinese men. And so he wore the clothes, and he actually shaved his head and grew his ponytail out so that he would look like the people of that culture. I want to give you an illustration of, of why this is important, that the gospel doesn't change, but our presentation of the gospel must change as we understand the story of the people that we're sharing with. So um, Forrest, he was a missionary in Africa for 21 years, and he told me a story that, um, that his organization used these colored bracelets to share the gospel. And so uh, as a missionary, Forrest in Africa, this is how they'd share the gospel. So they'd say gold would represent God, that God is holy. Um, he is set apart. Black would represent sin, that we are sinful. We're sinful people. We've disobeyed God. We've done wrong. Red would represent Jesus' blood, that Jesus went to the cross. His blood paid the price for our sins, that we might be saved. And then if we believe in him, that we would be made pure. So white would represent purity. We would be redeemed, and that uh, blue, we would get baptized first step in obedience to God and pleasing him. And green, lime green, would represent uh, growing in Christ. And so do you guys see what the problem would be for Forrest, a white guy, going to Africa to say black represents sin and white represents purity? You see that as an issue, right? And so he said, no, this isn't going to work here. We're going to have to change how we present the gospel, not what the gospel is. And so the third point, again, is to be mission-minded, we have to seek to understand the story of the people group and the individual that we're, we're interacting with. And the fourth point, we're going to actually read from John 4, 28 through 30. And we're going to skip this little discussion that Jesus has with the disciples about bread, and we're going to go to verse 39 through 42. And this fourth point is that To be mission-minded, we have to believe that a small interaction can have a big impact. That a small interaction can have a big impact. So John 4, verse 28 through 30, it says, 
So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And they went out of town and were coming to him. Verse 39, skipping the head here. It says, Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his word. They said to him, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. And so the result of this small interaction that Jesus had, it had a great impact on the Samaritan woman and it altered her reality so much that she went back to her town and she urged the people, come, come and see, come meet this guy, come hear what he did, come hear what he told me. This Jesus, is he the Christ? And many of them came and many of them decided to follow Jesus. They took her faith and they made it their own because of that small interaction that Jesus had with her at the well. I'm going to ask the band to come up. You guys can come back up. Um, I believe, too, that God can work through us in the same way, that the small interactions that we have with people can leave big impacts, that God can do big things in us and through us if we would allow God to work in us and through us. And I wrote down some questions. I want to read those just as some questions to think through, to reflect on today, this week, is... Are you a missions-minded person? Is, is missions something you care about? Is it something you think about? Do you pray for our missionaries? We want to be people who are missions-minded. We want to be people who care about the lost. The second question is, are there cultural differences or biases that you need to give to the Lord? I think this is an important question for us in the area that we live. Do we have biases? Do we have cultural differences that we need to give over to the Lord, that we need to give up. The third question, do you believe that God can use your small interactions with people to make big impacts on their lives? Because I think if we really believe that, that we will go outside of our comfort zone to have those conversations with the people that God has put in our lives, to have those conversations about Jesus and what Jesus has done in our lives. And the, the fourth point here is who, or first, fourth question to reflect on is, who in your life needs to hear the gospel message? Is there somebody in your life that needs to hear the gospel message, and God has put you in their lives as a person to share that with them? So I want to pray for us before we close out. So Father God, I just pray that you would help us to become mission-minded people, Lord, that we would be willing to share your gospel, that we would learn the gospel, that we would know the gospel, that we would trust the gospel. Father, that we would desire to make disciples of all nations. Lord, make disciples of the people that you've brought into our lives. Uh, Lord, help us to have compassion on the lost. Father, help us as we go out this week to see the opportunities that we have to speak your truth into people's lives. So I pray that you would encourage us, that you would motivate us, that you would give us strength. We love you, Lord. We pray these things in your name. Amen.